that is a large voting bloc. There are six states that determine the election in this country. You got to do what you can to get voters, and it is an issue. Hello, everyone. Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings, NASDAQ, MARA, discusses why the company recently completed the purchase of $100 million of Bitcoin to add to its balance sheet and why a potential Bitcoin strategic reserve is rumored to be announced by Donald Trump this week. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. Yeah, you are speaking to us from the Bitcoin Nashville conference. Thank you for tuning in while you're attending the conference. I appreciate it. Uh, what's the sentiment there right now uh, in regards to Bitcoin? Last year I attended, it was, uh, it, I have to say, it was relatively dead. There were very few people in attendance last year relative to the year before. Um, and uh, I don't know how it is this year. I'm not there. Well, let's see. We have Donald Trump coming. We have RFK here today. Uh, we have a whole plethora of senators and members of the House of Representatives. Um, and we have a number of members of the uh, leaders of the Democratic Party here. Uh, there's no reason for any of them to be here other than the fact that they want to talk to people in this industry and they want to talk to Bitcoiners. Donald Trump and the Republican Party have made Bitcoin part of their national platform. They've made Bitcoin mining part of their national platform. The Democrats uh, are starting to look at this. You know, think about the legislative branch and the recent votes that have been held on SAB 121. It was a bipartisan vote where even Chuck Schumer voted against his own president on a bill. So this is becoming an issue that is very important for voters. And I think what you'll find is the Democrats under President Biden, with Senator Warren kind of leading for crypto army, attacked crypto and um, thought that there would be no price to pay because it's such a small group of people that are involved in crypto. But it's 50 million voters and has had an impact and so now all of a sudden you're seeing both parties looking to attract those voters to their causes. You know, Bitcoin is not just a great financial asset. It's also a point um, for voters under the age of 40, something they view as important. And they want to have access to it and they want to be able to use it and trade it freely um, and not have it be banned or have access to banking be eliminated for companies involved in Bitcoin, et cetera. I just spoke to an economist on the issue of Donald Trump potentially announcing a Bitcoin strategic reserve. Hasn't officially happened yet, but th there's a lot of rumors like he, uh, you know, like you just pointed out. Mm -hmm. And his retort, his, I guess, criticism of this policy is that why would you want, as a nation, why would you want a, in his words, volatile asset with no inherent or intrinsic value to be a strategic reserve asset some sort of any sort of backing i mean that's what el salvador did and by the way they incurred losses when bitcoin went down so why would you want that how would you how would you respond to this so here's the interesting thing you can mine all the gold you want on this planet so no matter how much gold you have on your balance sheet somebody's going to keep mining it you can't control that market the uh, foreign nations who have uh, essentially been banned from the dollar environment because of sanctions are looking for a vehicle to transact and do business that is outside of the control of the U.S. dollar and the U.S. government. Bitcoin is one of those. If Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia, and the countries that want to trade commodities, because remember, the petrodollar deal is dead. Those commodities no longer have to be priced in dollars. If they want to start moving to holding their reserve assets in Bitcoin, there's nothing the U.S. can do to stop them transacting. There's nothing the U.S. can do to confiscate it unless it's held in a U.S. financial institution. And so the U.S. to project power in the Bitcoin network, in the Bitcoin world, needs to own Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one of the top eight assets in the world. Right? Look at art. I'll give you an example. Talk to an economist. What intrinsic value does owning a Picasso have? It only has value because people attribute value to it and think it's valuable. But his art could go out of favor and it would have no value. It's a piece of canvas with some ink on it. So I think it's very important for people to realize that Bitcoin is not a fly-by-night thing. It's held by millions of people. 
Its market cap is in the trillions of dollars. The Bitcoin ETF are proof. It's the fastest and most successful ETF launch ever. Look at the amount of flows that go into these things. You have pension funds like the state of Wisconsin Investment Board that hold hundreds of millions of dollars in Bitcoin and Bitcoin investments. Why would these types of asset managers be interested in holding Bitcoin? It's because it generates a great yield. Show me any asset that has performed this well over the past 10 years. None. To the point about the petrodollar agreement, yeah, it was debatable whether or not there was an official agreement in place in the first place. But to your broader point, yes, you're right. A lot of people are looking for alternatives to trade with something besides the dollar. Is Bitcoin going to be this alternative, you think? I don't think it's necessarily going to be the currency of exchange, but it will definitely be a reserve asset where people store their money. I don't think the Saudis want to hold a bunch of rubles, renminbi, and rupees, right? There's a reason they hold dollars. It's because rule of law, it's stable, and it's safe. Well, the problem is they've been funding the U.S. deficit. And at over $35 trillion, servicing that deficit, that debt, rather, has now gotten to the point where it's larger than a lot of entitlement spending. And if the U.S. were to hold 2 million Bitcoin, 10% of the Bitcoin, uh, of all the Bitcoin in the world, and Bitcoin were to climb into the millions of dollars, you now have trillions of dollars in your reserve that you could use to pay off parts of the deficit or even all the deficit. There isn't another way for the US to deal with the deficit other than allowing inflation to run rampant and letting the dollar become devalued. Um, I think the timing of your purchase is um, is is um, up for uh, what, what people have been questioning. Why now? Why did, was this a decision that you came to uh, with, with the board uh, over a long period of time? Or was it just because you felt the price is right now, so to speak? We think we're at the beginning of an inflection point in Bitcoin from an adoption perspective. Um, the Bitcoin ETFs were the beginning of the potential for institutionalization of Bitcoin as an investment asset. It made it easy for any asset manager to hold Bitcoin, just like they could hold the stock in any company. And as soon as the wirehouses finalize compliance, because to this date, the vast majority of people who've invested in these ETFs are retail investors. As soon as the wirehouses finish compliance and various pension funds finish their compliance, you're going to see a large volume of retirement assets go into Bitcoin denominated assets whether it's ETFs, whether it's equities of Bitcoin companies like ours or, ma- or MicroStrategy, uh, there are lots of ways to get exposure to it. You know, there's 40 plus trillion dollars of pension assets and one or 2% of those going into Bitcoin will have a huge impact. Remember, it is a finite asset. It's not like buying stock in IBM or Tesla who can just issue more stock. It's not like gold where you can just mine more gold. Um, I, I think one of the concerns around the Bitcoin ETFs is let's suppose it grows even bigger beyond what it's already uh, been achieved or what has already been achieved. Uh, and by the way, it's been like the most successful ETF launch in history by volume of transactions. But the question is, suppose it gets bigger, wouldn't Bitcoins be taken out of circulation to be used in these ETFs and derivative products, thereby making it less likely to be used as a medium of exchange? Well, yeah, I don't think you have to look at Bitcoin from multiple angles. One is as an investment asset, right? Picassos are not a medium of, of exchange. There are something people have invested in, right? And there are only so many Picassos available on the market today, right? If you want to buy Banksy, you have to find somebody willing to sell a Banksy unless he paints one for you. So it's the same thing with Bitcoin. If the... Um, ETFs end up soaking up a large percentage of Bitcoin and other sovereign nations start soaking up a large volume of Bitcoin. Yeah, there won't be a lot available, but that, what will that do to the price of Bitcoin? It will go through the roof. Because again, there are only 21 million Bitcoin. And of that 21 million, 19.8 are arguably already in circulation. 
Based on your um, interactions with people at the conference, uh, what's the sentiment on the price right now? It's been hovering around $60,000 to $75,000 for a f- couple of months now, um, range bound. Um, is it cons- Well, it has been consolidating. People have been liking this to, likening this to the uh, $20,000 period from a few years ago before it bounced up much higher. Um, or it could go down. I mean, it, it really depends on what the sentiment is. What are, what are you hearing? Um, I... I- Again, I, I don't think politicians would be speaking to the Bitcoin audience about wanting to do reserve currencies, wanting to do um, promoting Bitcoin mining as a strategic initiative in the country and wanting to view how uh, regulation can be made uh, better uh, around these assets. If there wasn't demand from institutional investors for it, and if there wasn't demand for people for it, and so the sentiment is very bullish. You know, you have a lot of people feeling this is like the early stages of 2021. But the difference is you now have a regulated financial instrument that anybody can acquire to hold Bitcoin that doesn't require you to open a wallet. It doesn't require you to hold keys. It doesn't require you to actually hold it or transfer it. You call your broker, you buy shares in an ETF, and you're done. It's that simple. But but speaking of politicians, yeah, we didn't have this amount of interest from senior level management in the government a few years ago, even uh, two years ago. I remember when I attended the conference. What changed well, the last couple of years? The Biden administration ceded financial policy to Senator Warren and her group of people who felt that attacking crypto because of the FTX issues was something that would cost the Democrats nothing and allow them to really control an industry and squash an industry, just like they tried to do by controlling banking for the cannabis industry or for other industries. They went after the on-ramps and off-ramps to crypto. They went after the companies that were involved in crypto. The SEC went out and filed lawsuits. They tried to do everything they could to kill it over the past three years. Now you have a different tenor in their tone. Is it because... Popular sentiment towards Bitcoins and cryptos have been shifting as well. 50 million voters have a perspective on Bitcoin that's positive. That is a large voting block. There are six states that determine the election in this country. You got to do what you can to get voters. And it is an issue. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Fred Thiel. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.